Yeah, hi, I'm Alex. Um, uh, last year I've been doing a fellowship with Mozilla, but um, I'm a neuroscientist, that's my background. Um, and I just wanted to talk a bit today um, about what's next after Jupyter Notebooks. The spoiler is that it's more Jupyter Notebooks. Um, uh, but first, I just to kind of give you an idea of the, the motivation of, of why I've started working on this stuff. Um, is we're going to do a little create our own adventure. So I don't know if anyone did those books as a kid where you get to choose uh, the end of your story, you get to choose the path. Or on Netflix, there was Bandersnatch recently where you could do that as a show. And we're going to do one quickly now, um, and then I promise you it's relevant. Um, so it's a sunny day in Portland. Um, you've just left home and you're walking to give a presentation you're super excited about. Um, but the, the thing you're walking on is tiled. So I don't know about you, but I sometimes try and step in the center of the tiles rather than on the edges. Um, maybe that's just me. But so. Uh, we're going to have a vote. Do we think we should just ignore the tiles and walk, maybe like a normal person? Or should we adjust our strides so that we don't step on the edges? So who thinks we should walk normally? A. And B. Who thinks we should adjust it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm stoked. This is a good audience. Um, so unfortunately, we didn't notice some dude looking at his phone, um, and he's just spilled our coffee on our shirt, and we're on our way to give a talk, and there's no way we can give a talk looking like this. So we've got two choices now. We can either have a look in the shop around the corner, um, but it's a second-hand shop and they might not have our size. Or we can sprint all the way back home. Um, we should be able to make it there and back in time for the talk. So who thinks, A, we should go to the shop on the corner? <laughs> and, and B, who thinks we should run back home? <laughs> what do we think? Um, let's, I, think, I think we're going to go with A. Um, so we walk, pick, walk, pick up the pace and walk quickly to Hats and Cats, which is your favorite clothes store. <laughs> Luckily, it's open, and you have a quick look around, and they have the perfect shirt, and it's going to go ace with your jacket. Um, and so that's the story. I, uh, I could tell you that that was the most boring ending you could have possibly chosen. Um, <laughs> you could have either adopted a cat, you could have met Michelle Obama. Um, <laughs> But unfortunately, we've we got a nice shirt anyway. Um, and so what, what, what I feel, how I feel, um, oh, let's skip that, um, is that doing data analysis is often a bit more like this choose your own adventure thing than writing an essay. Um, but the way we, we present it is, is as if it's just a, a nice story. And sometimes that's good. It's nice to have a good, strong narrative to be able to explain what you're doing to people. Um, but sometimes we want to share the whole process. We want to share these forks, these decisions we've made. Um, and we want to be able to do that while we're developing. We want to be able to take different directions and, and be able to see from a high level what we're doing. So what I'm going to do is um, describe a few pain points, I guess, that uh, we've observed from watching people use uh, notebooks, um, and have a look at some uh, potential uh, new concepts for interfaces that build off the Jupyter Notebook stack, uh, and, but allow us to, to have a little bit more complexity in these flows. Um, so the first set of observations, I guess if anyone says they've worked with Jupyter Notebooks and they don't have a folder that looks like this, then I absolutely don't believe you. Um, <laughs> Uh, the second one is people copy and pasting cells because you might want to make a little change to one cell, but then you want to compare how the output of the first one looks to the second one, and then you scroll up and down. Or we've seen a bunch of people going through entire cells and commenting out each line just because they're not sure whether they're going to delete that or not. Um, and these kind of, I'm not sure if I'll need it later things, uh, tend to be the use case that people will say, OK, you should be using version control. And that's great, but often these small changes are, are not atomic things that you might want to commit as a single thing in version control. Um, and also, you want to be really explicitly comparing what you had before to what change you had. So um, we designed an interface that uh, kind of embraces this copy one, copy two thing, but uh, does it in a little bit more of a structured manner. So um, kind of on the, on the basics, this is uh, kind of like a normal notebook, maybe with some cell templating. Um, the only thing to notice that's slightly different is that we uh, enforce that people have some text to describe what each cell is um, attached to each cell. Uh, and then we can play it. And the only other, the other thing is that we pin the outputs to the bottom here. Um, sorry, this is a bit unclear on the screen, but I think, I think you'll get the idea. So the key thing here is that we can then make uh, a fork of this notebook, but have it um, appear visually 
and so that we can see exactly what changes we're going to make. So what we've done there is just made a fork from that first cell, and then we're going to make a change in that cell. Um, and we can immediately see what the change in that cell there, which is highlighted, has had, what impact that has had on the output. Um, and we can do the same thing again. We could make another fork from that first cell uh, and maybe use a different style. And we can compare them all. Uh, we can collapse different things to see, compare back to the first one. Don't know who's using this so slowly. Um, and we can also fork off any other cell as well, not just the first one. So maybe we wanted to change the data instead. Um, we can make a fork here. And then if we decided that this, in fact, this last one is exactly what we want, we can make it, or we can collapse the other ones and make this one the main branch in the end. Um, so this is concept number one. Um, so in terms of the implementation, this is just a collection of no notebooks. Um, there's everything else is just uh, UI on the top, um, but we can discuss that more in a bit if you want. So the second set of observations is, uh, is hidden state bugs. So this is when um, people make a change uh, to a variable in a notebook somewhere and or in any code, um, and you don't realize that you've changed it somewhere else, and you might be executing cells out of order, and then you end up with a bug because of that. Um, we also see people have lots of shared cells between notebooks, or they're scrolling up and down, and that's because you want to explore multiple different avenues for analyzing one data set. But those different avenues might share a lot of code, um, but you don't necessarily want them to share all the state. Uh, so we're trying to design an interface that allows us to like, explicitly share some, some stuff, but not share the state between different parts. And um, so this is one example of, of what it might look like. I can't pause it. Um, so maybe we've, we've loaded some data in here, and then we're going to plot it down there, because that's the first thing you do when you should load data, is have a look at it. Um, but there's no reason that when I normalize this time series here, there's absolutely no reason that any change in state here should be affecting anything I do here, because they're not part of the same, they're not part of the same flow. Um, and so here we, we filter the data and we plot it again, and we can do some more things. We can compare the signals uh, down here and um, up here. We compute the energy of the signals. But again, there's no reason that this, anything that happens here, should be affecting the plot I made at the beginning. So there's this idea that we can separate the state out in the user interface. Um, and also, one of the nice things about having forcing people to have the text above each cell and not as a separate cell is that we can do things like this. We can collapse the whole thing and see. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly the right reaction. <laughs> um, and yeah, see the, the whole f of flow there. Uh, so the implementation of something like this, there are a few different ways it, um, that we're exploring that it, it could work. The first is that each uh, separate flow will have a different kernel. Um, that's the easiest to do, but it causes some, uh, well, it's certainly not the most performant way of doing it. One of the other ways is in object-oriented languages, or um, we can just serialize all of the objects that are in a particular cell, and then we can do lookups when I, whenever you execute each cell, which means you only have to execute each cell once. Um, or we can do something that will work with all languages, which is capture the whole state of the process in memory at that time and serialize that to disk. Uh, how much time have we got left? Oh. Until we kick you out of the room. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Um, you have five to ten minutes. <laughs> we'll just go through this last one. Um, so, if any of you were in talk before, we know that one of the, I guess, one of the things a lot of scientists struggle with um, is having really complex processing pipelines and then having to change them later. So, um, one of the things I've seen in almost every single lab I've been into is that. People, uh, it's really difficult to onboard a new person to the lab with the whole pipeline that they have. Um, and you have a lot of debugging or reporting stages embedded in with the actual pipeline. And it's really 
difficult to just get an idea of what's going on without spending a lot of time diving heavily into some complex code. Um, so one of the things we've been working on is um, whether we can use, whether we can have a common graphical interface for a whole bunch of different pipelining languages. So um, here we might generate a shell script at the beginning. Um, you can set it up on the right. And then we can basically do anything with this. So this is a bit like how to draw an owl. And then we just press the button and everything comes up. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about this model is that the idea is that we're just building an interface. So like Jupyter Notebooks, we're not building the kernels. We're just building an interface. And then we can have separate pipelining kernels in the background. So a pipelining kernel could just be, uh, oops, could just be something like make. So, um, or it could be a common workflow language, or it could be Apache Kafka. It, it could be any of these amazing tools that people have already built. Um, but that are really hard to get a handle on of like exactly where the data is moving in those different tools. Um, yeah, and that's it from me. Thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions, so lots of question time. Uh, thank you, Annie. Really interesting talk. Um, I'm curious if you thought about how uh, this this interesting work and the interfacing work and stuff, particularly for the, the forking of notebooks, might play with um, how that might play out in a different notebook environment, um, such as observable notebooks, which are this reactive, where you don't have the, the state problem, like with the ordering of uh, evaluation problem, um, and how that might that might work in that sort of environment versus something like Jupyter. Yeah, I, so I guess if anything, that's like almost better to have it in that in, um, in that environment. Um, so when uh, I started working on this, I was kind of looking at observable Jupyter and I died as the kind of three data science in the browser things. Um, and all the work that we're going to do is going to be just UI, so it could be put anywhere. And so that would be the dream. Um, starting off with Jupyter just because it's got the most users and that's the way I think have the biggest impact. But yeah, having where something where you don't run the code, where, where it's reactive like observable is like the dream use case for something like this. But not everyone likes to do everything in JavaScript, so. <laughs> this and when can we try it out? And, like, <laughs> what can I send people a link to? That's, that's <laughs> yeah, so um, at the moment I have a, a GitHub repository called Graphical Notebooks. Uh, the three different um, things at the moment have the, the name, I hardly even remember the name of the first one. The first one's up for grabs if anyone wants to name it. The second one is uh, Jupyter Canvas and the third one is Jupyter Flow. Um, I am currently um, writing a job post for a developer to prototype two of them. Um, and yeah, so within the next few months, we'll have prototypes. Um, and there'll be definitely links to it on the graphical notebooks repo. Okay. Can you can you clarify exactly the kind of? Like you're saying that usually it's painted as one story. Yeah. I think when we talk about data analysis, start to finish, and that's what you read in the paper. But that when people are starting out and they find that they're not doing that, I think you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, but then we don't talk about, as you 
say, let's try some different things and appreciate that as a part of the process. Yeah, so I, I think that's, um, it's like there's a really interesting conflict because I think as humans, we find it much easier to understand something as a story. And so it makes sense to present things in that way to people. Um, but you're right, it isn't the process that actually underlies it. I think there's kind of two sides with the like hypothesis driven stuff. So you could still have hypothesis, like very strong hypotheses, but there would still be branches and you want to do check this and this and this. There's very rarely like just one plot that's going to tell you the answer to something. Um, so I think, I think yeah, it's, it's always difficult to know um, how much of the complexity you should share or how much we should just be telling people this stuff nearly always starts out crazy and then you have to trim it down. Yeah, so I mean, uh, definitely everything that we're going for here is, is piggybacking off the notebook structure. Um, and um, so I was speaking to the team last week, and I think like one of the biggest things that they've done with notebooks is have uh, a data format that's been around for now five years that's barely changed and it's really well structured. And you can do basically anything with that. Um, and what people have done so far is just had cells in order. But what we're now trying to do is say, how can we organize this exactly the same data format, but in different ways? Uh, to fit different models of data exploration. Um, hi, so I think this is great. As someone who struggles with a lot of these problems with the crazy large notebooks, it's really useful. Um, I wonder, I, have you, have you, do you worry that by adding this new tool that could help, you could actually inadvertently make things worse? Right? Before we had like one long notebook, now we have like 10 parallel long notebooks. <laughs> and I, I see how this can make it better, but like is there, could this create new sorts of problems? Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> um, the, the kind of idea is that instead of, we we'll probably end up having exactly the same mess, but a slightly more structured mess. And for me, that's better. Um, but what certainly what we're planning on doing is uh, as soon as we've got a, like a reasonable prototype going is giving this to a whole bunch of people and seeing what happens. Um, and we're totally happy to pivot um, if, that, if that is exactly what happens. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if I can click on this. So the, the, uh, in the forking one or in the graphing, in the graph one? The forking one, I'll go with that. Okay, so, so the forking one, um, the link is, is just that they would probably literally just be notebooks in a folder with a naming schema. Um, so in terms of the diffing, it would just, we'd just do diffing using MBDime. Um, and so there's no explicit link that's not just enforced by the interface. Um, for the graphing one, where we have we have splits and things like that, it would um, it's all still fitting in within the notebook schema and just going to be metadata where each cell will point to its next cell, and it doesn't just go to the next cell automatically. Um, so the idea is to do as little as possible so that all of this can still be used in a regular notebook browser. So where do we go in Portland to meet Michelle? <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, no, you have to turn up early for your talk, and then she ends up being there waiting for you. We have time for one more. I just more have a comment on why I like this. <laughs> um, I manage like teams of undergrads, and I think a lot of things at VIDS at, at the Berkeley Institute of Neuroscience, we talk about managing teams. And one thing that keeps coming up is the like sanity checks. And those sanity checks, when you're working alone, are very invisible. Um, but when I get their notebooks, I don't know what sanity checks they do, so I redundantly do the sanity checks myself, which is a lot of times just like changing the variable in this level. Um, so I love that that would be transparent. So one feature I would love for you to add when you <laughs> continue this is a way to like mark those branches to be like, Reviewers check the sanity check or have that like sanity check like tag or some sort of tagging system for the branches. Yeah. That's the only sort of comment that's allowed in a talk. That was a good one. <laughs> Where are the good endings? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 The nonlinear flow of managing state in these things is like a challenge already, and this seems to just exponentiate that problem. I'm just curious if, like, if there's other things you can add to this to stop that, like, so that to help the novice user know that they're actually manipulating their state in a, in a nonlinear fashion. Yeah. So there's the there's the out of order bit, which um, I think. In so one of the one of the uh, I guess one of the solutions I've pointed at for having these these branches um, is caching individual cells. So when we have something like this, this is actually a directed graph. And so if we once we're caching what each cell does, let's say let's we ignore how we do that. We've got some cool ideas about how to do that. Um, actually, if we know that we're changing something here and none of this has changed, we can rerun that without any penalty. So we can actually have this like observable like reactive environment but still using um, Jupyter, uh, still using Jupyter and Python. So that's, that would be one of the cool di directions to go is like treat the whole thing as a directed graph and cache the state of each cell um, or each flow, each co like combination of cells. And that totally breaks all Jupyter like protocols. It would still be, this, it would just be a different kernel. It would be, that's, cool. yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? Maybe the mic, please help. Just out of curiosity, um, so how sustain, scalable is this like, if you are creating a hash for each cell? So, um, Depends. So there are two different. So the, if you're doing the the um, so if you were doing the hash of each cell in terms of oops disk space, it's the least sustainable. So you're using the most disk space when you serialize the state of each cell. Um, in terms of computationally, it's the most efficient because you never rerun anything that you don't need to rerun. Um, if you were to do multiple kernels, it's the opposite. You don't save anything to disk. It's the most disk efficient, but you have four kernels running at the same time, which if you're running a big Jupyter Hub binder hub instance is a, is a big issue. Um, so those are the, the trade-offs um, when we're trying to look at which one works best. Yeah. 